This video is sponsored by Teleport, a free open source secure access platform. Learn more about how to get started with Teleport and the challenge that I'm going to be offering in a few moments. In this video, I will be overviewing the anatomy of a common cyber attack targeted towards a business enterprise. I will be overviewing the common steps used by adversaries to trick users, gain access, gather information, and deploy whatever they desire. These high-level steps are known as the cyber kill chain. Okay, an overview of today's attack scenario, we have a Windows 10 distribution here simulating an enterprise workstation and we have good old Kali Linux the attacker machine trying to get into this Windows 10 system before getting started with this attack let's be 100% real here the likelihood of this being a real world scenario attack is like 0.01% this attack scenario can be easily followed by lots of blogs and in today's modern environment traditional tools and technologies such as antivirus signatures not even something that's revolutionary or email filtering gateways could pick up this attack pretty quickly. So yeah, this isn't really realistic. And the reason why I'm doing this is just because of the ease of use and well, I'm a script kitty. In this scenario, I want to show you the insides or the anatomy of a cyber attack. What happens to get to the point where you see this screen where you've been debudad? Well, of course there is multiple steps and these steps are known as the cyber kill chain. The cyber kill chain is a high level framework which was developed in 2011 by Lockheed Martin to describe the anatomy of a cyber attack. There's been a lot of change since 2011. So the cyber kill chain serves as a foundational framework for a cyber attack. Now, as the evolution of IT, the attacks landscape, and all the other words you could use have evolved, uh, more advanced frameworks such as the MITRE attack framework have been developed. Now, the MITRE attack framework is a detailed knowledge base for showing the tactics, the techniques, and the procedures used by attackers. With this background knowledge, let's jump into this attack scenario. And if you don't really care to watch this video, go look up the cyber kill chain. It's a good concept to keep in mind. An attacker has decided that they want to hack, so it's time to test their skills. The first step they need to do is find a victim, and they have landed on Dibuda Incorporated, a merchandising company. The attacker begins by performing some reconnaissance or discovery. Using tools such as Google Dorks, which probes for hidden files indexed on Google, Shodan, a search engine used to find IoT and internet exposed devices, DNS dig command and nmap to scan known IP address spaces, basic open source intelligence like checking social media, looking at the WHOIS records of the DNS of dbuda.com, or using tools like GoBuster to find names and subdomains associated with the Dibuda merchandising company. Using these tools, the attacker is able to build maybe a basic profile of the company's internet assets, some of their operations and, and their overall culture, and perhaps discover employees such as Grant. Grant is an employee of the Dibuda merchandising company, and the attacker wants to find out Grant's email address so that they can email them some interesting information. Using the at dibuda.com domain address, they use common naming conventions such as Grant, Grant C, or Collins G, and they find out that Grant C at dibuda.com is a valid email. Now it's time to begin the next phase of the attack, weaponization. It's time for the attacker to use their elite attacker skills and develop the payload. Using a very common penetration testing framework, Metasploit, the attacker has decided to send an executable file with a reverse shell. More on this in a few moments. Metasploit has many uses, and one of them is to create basic payloads. In this case, I'm going to create a basic Windows file executable that's going to impersonate some merchandising design software. In the background, this payload is actually going to establish a reverse shell back to this attacker machine seen here. So the first thing that we need to do is create this executable using MS Venom. First, let's look at the IP address. This is going to be the IP that the victim machine will connect back to in the executable once they launch it. Here is our little class C address. And let's go ahead and create this payload. We're going to use MS Venom. I've already done this before here. And basically what I'm doing is creating a Windows interpreter reverse TCP shell. Our listening host is going to be our IP address and a port we can use any arbitrary port. In this case, it's going to be the executable file extension. And let's call this tdesign underscore one or tdesign 
software. Press enter and let this develop. I got all these warnings here. Let's look at our directory. Perform an LS and you're gonna see tdesignsoftware.exe. Boom, done. Now we need to deliver this executable. Now in a real world scenario, of course, you'd probably add some sort of design logo to this so that the user thinks it's a legitimate application. I'm lazy, I'm not going to add a logo. In this case, we need to deliver this and I've decided that, that I'm going to host this executable up on my own infrastructure. Okay, I've opened a second terminal screen. Let's go into the var www HTML directory. Performing an LS here, you're gonna see just some default web pages. Let's copy over our executable into this. Performing an LS, you can see we have our executable here. And finally, we need to make sure that our web server is running on this machine so that the user can go out and install this executable. To do this, let's just do a service Apache 2 start. All right, so our web server is running. It's hosting our malicious executable file. Now it's on to the delivery. Okay, so here I have a Windows 10 machine, a common OS in an enterprise environment. And now it's time for the attacker to deliver their weapon. In this case, a dumb malicious executable into an email. Now, before we do that, you have to go back to the attacker machine and the attacker needs to embed this link where the executable can be downloaded into some sort of maybe social engineering technique. In this case, of course, I'm going to be using the traditional phishing email. If we go to our home directory, I've created an email and here I will add in into this href tag, the malicious uh, executable web server. In a real world scenario, this would actually be a domain, not an IP address. It already looks suspicious, but like I said, I'm lazy. So let's go ahead, save this file. And now the attacker will go ahead and put that into an email and send that to Grant. So Grant will look at this email and decide that, well, okay, well, it's time to go ahead and get this since there's 10 usable licenses, maybe my boss needs me to get this software that's been onboarded. Now to do this, they're just gonna go ahead and click this link here and boom, we now have the software downloaded. So back onto the attacker machine, it's time to set up our terminal or this machine here to accept a TCP connection from the victim machine. We're gonna use the MSF council to do this. So let's clear the screen and do the MSF council. In MSF council or Metasploit, we're gonna go and set up just a few parameters. First, we're gonna use the exploit multi-handler, use Next, we're gonna set the payload, set the listening host, and then finally use exploit. Now we just wait for the victim, Grant in this case, to click on that link and download the exploit. Okay, so our unwitting or unaware user is gonna come here. They're going to download the test design software and see what happens. Now, like I said, dumb scenario, this will not really work, but let's just run this anyway, who cares? Well, shoot, nothing happened. That's great. Well, going back to our attacker machine, we see a new interpreter session has opened and now, well, we've established a foothold. Okay, so in this simple example, this reverse TCP shell is acting as the uh, C2 or command and control server. 
Now, like I said, a reverse shell is going to establish a connection back to the attacker machine. And in this case, the attacker's machine is this Kali machine. And what we can do here is, you know, the attacker can now have established uh, persistent access. They can upload more sophisticated malware, maybe create a backdoor uh, or probe the network and try to escalate their privileges. In this case, using our mature predator shell here, we can actually just use the shell command. And we are in to the Windows 10 laptop. And this is where we can do whatever we want to, um, you know, look for administrative users and, and do what, well, they set out to do. Well, this machine has been fully compromised. At this point, the attacker can do whatever they set out to do. In this case, as you can see, I have uploaded a wallpaper called You've Been Debudad. In a real world scenario, this is where an actual attacker will go out, they'll will um, set up malware, ransomware, perform some espionage, maybe data, data or trade secret exfiltration, whatever they desire to do. In most cases, because attackers are financially incentivized, they'll probably deploy some sort of encryptor, ransomware, malware, uh, to you know get some funds. Based on today's video setup, as you can see, there are many different stages to a successful security attack. And one primary flaw, especially in developer ecosystems, is fine-grained access control. It is imperative that you know who has access to what resources. There are, of course, many different solutions to solve this issue, and one of them is using a tool like Teleport. Here's how Teleport works. You have an auth service, which acts as the certificate authority for a cluster. This issues certificates to clients and maintains an audit log. Now, a cluster can be users and servers, and these users and servers must authenticate and receive these certificates. Once these devices receive the certificates, a proxy service is set up to allow access to cluster from the outside world. Once you're authenticated into the service, your device will receive a public certificate, and the auth service will have that private certificate and these certificates will expire after a period of time. So now you can go into your internal applications, whether that's through SSH, Kubernetes clusters, Windows RDP, whatever it is, and these certificates are managed for you. I recently created a passwordless home wrap crash course with this free open source tool. So if you're interested in learning more about the possible future of a password passwordless approach, check out this video or go to teleport.com. Thanks to Teleport for sponsoring today's video.